Bienvenue à En Oubliant. Je suis Ian, and today we are going to take a look at Le Clarion, the bugle, the FAMAS. This is the standard combat rifle of the French army for at least the next couple months, I think at this point. Uh, these were originally adopted in 1978 by the French military, and they are still in use today, although they are actually in the final stages of choosing a replacement for this weapon. So, it seemed like a good idea to take a look at this before it's completely gone, uh, because the FAMAS here is one of the very first bullpups actually adopted by a major military power. Now, the very first one, of course, was the, uh, the British EM-2, which was adopted for about 10 minutes and then unadopted, and never put into any substantial production. And then right about the same time as the FAMAS was adopted, the Steyr AUG was also adopted. So those two came in really effectively simultaneously. So in addition to being a bullpup action, meaning that the magazine and action are located behind the trigger instead of in front of it, the FAMAS is also interesting because it is actually a delayed blowback 5.56 rifle. That's a pretty unusual setup to have. Specifically, it's levered delayed, which is also a pretty unusual system to use. There are not many examples of levered delayed blowback rifles out there. So we will take this apart in a few minutes and we'll take a close look at exactly how this works. The upshot is it makes for a very simple rifle. There's no gas system to deal with. The bolt only has a couple of parts in it. Well, four parts, really, not counting little things like the extractor and ejector. And it makes for a very appealing package for a military force. Now, the French went with a bullpup configuration because it allowed them to shorten the overall length of the rifle without getting rid of barrel length. So the barrels went this long. Um, in a normal rifle, the, the end of the stock would come way back to here. This lets you shorten it up. That was seen as a, a good compromise for use, well, because French troops were spending a lot of time in vehicles, armored cars, helicopters. This was uh, 1970s, we're looking at a lot of mobile warfare. Uh, you don't have guys simply marching on foot as much, or at least that was the theory. And giving them a nice, short, compact rifle in a vehicle was a big advantage. Now, despite that, they wanted to give it all of the other benefits of a standard combat rifle. So there are actually a lot of features in this thing. Uh, obviously, it can mount a bayonet. Uh, it was also designed to use rifle grenades, two different types. There is a rifle grenade sight here, which is missing from this one because this is a semi-auto civilian sail FAMAS. Um, it has a long-range sight, it has a close-range sight, it has a setup for night sights. Uh, it can actually be converted from left to right-handed, which is a big advantage. Normally, one of the major trade-offs of a bullpup is that the shooter's face basically covers the ejection port area. So if it's set to eject out the, the right and you try and shoot it as a left-hander, you're going to get a mouthful of brass and very unpleasant. Uh, however, the FAMAS, like the AUG at the same time, is actually reasonably easy to convert. You can't do it on the fly, but you don't need any extra parts to convert this thing from left to right handed shooting. Uh, it was equipped with a fire control mechanism in the military gun that was uh, single shot, safe, three round burst, and or full auto. Um, it had a burst setting, and then it had a second selector where you could deactivate the burst which would turn the burst setting into a full auto setting. Now at this point, the French army still had universal conscription, so the burst setting wasn't there because burst is really a good idea with trained professionals. The burst setting was there because they had a lot of totally untrained conscripts being handed these rifles, and you didn't want them to set it to full auto and just spray bullets all over the place. If you can mechanically confine a, a recruit to a three round burst in full auto, you'll at least prolong the magazine. Speaking of the magazines, uh, these use a proprietary 25 round magazine. They do use the standard 5.56 NATO cartridge, but at the time, France had to be a little different. They kind of always had to be a little different. Um, and in addition, the 30 round uh, NATO, well, US standard magazines at the time are in fact rather longer. And it was thought that maybe this would be too long and get in the way when you were shooting prone. Um, in addition, the French wanted to design a cheaper disposable magazine. Now, the disposable magazine had been the concept with the U.S. Stanag uh, AR-15 magazine in the first place, but just as happened to the French, also happened to the U.S., the military got in and, like, the very moment the first magazine was about to be thrown away because it had been emptied, someone decided, yo, wait a minute, you know, that magazine costs us like a dollar to make and it's not totally useless yet, let's just go ahead and reload it and use it again. 
and so the disposable magazines very quickly became reusable magazines. Uh, this ended up causing problems in both armies, but I think a little bit more so in the French, uh, where the magazines simply, they weren't originally built to last, and when you started using them over and over and over, they'd wear out. So the magazines caused a number of problems in these rifles. Like I said, these were originally adopted in 1978. The original design process started in 1967, so this spent quite a bit of time in development. Uh, once it was adopted, it was adopted basically in this configuration. This is called the FAMAS F1, and uh, uh, roughly 400,000 of these were manufactured. They are the standard, army, standard rifle still today of the French Army. Uh, however, in 1994, the French Navy adopted an updated version, the FAMAS G2. Now, the G2 has a number of substantial changes. One of them is it has a full hand trigger guard, kind of like the Steyr Aug or the Israeli Tavor. Uh, also, and more importantly, it uses standard AR-15 magazines, which is a nice advantage at, when you've got these mags, which it kind of, it may have made sense for a national military, having interchangeable magazines isn't that big a deal, but when you start doing a lot of cooperative work with NATO, and when the original magazines don't work all that well, it makes sense to go to the standard NATO magazine. Uh, the other big change from the F1 to the G2 was the rifling. Now, these were originally made with a 1 in 12 twist. I don't want to get super technical nerdy on the ammo here, but the 1 in 12 twist is only good for lightweight bullets. Well, when this was designed, the NATO standard was a 55 grain bullet. Short, light, very high velocity. And this rifle works just fine with 55 grain, although, well, almost fine. Uh, it actually used a steel case. Um, because this is levered delayed blowback, there's a lot, there's a relatively high pressure uh, when the cartridge is trying to extract, and a steel cased round dealt with that pressure better than brass. These also have fluted chambers to also ameliorate the problems of high extraction pressure. So the French had a couple of tools in this rifle to deal with that, the, the steel case, the flutes. Um, when NATO started going to, well NATO always used brass, but when NATO went to a heavier 62 grain armor piercing or semi armor piercing bullet, these rifles kind of had trouble with that. Um, the brass case wasn't as, as reliable for them, and now the 1 in 12 rifling is too slow of a twist to adequately stabilize a heavier bullet. So 62 grain bullets don't stabilize. They'll keyhole and they're not particularly accurate out of these guns. I have heard but not totally really confirmed that the 62 grain bullets also have a slightly different pressure curve uh, and they don't run as reliably. Um, barrel twist and case material aside, they're the bullet weight may also contribute some problems. So the French had to continue to use their own specific steel-cased 55 grain ammo with the F1 rifle. Now the Navy adopted G2, fixed that problem. They went to, I believe, a 1-9 twist. And the, the bolt is, again, if I don't know for sure if they had to make changes to the bolt. If they did, they did make them because the G2s do run just fine on 62 grain ammo. So the one other benefit that the French were trying to get out of this bullpup concept is that when they adopted this rifle, uh, they used it to replace not one rifle in service, but two. This was the, the official replacement for both the Moss 4956, which was a 7.5 by 54 caliber semi-auto combat rifle. And they also used it to replace the Mat 49, which was their 9mm Parabellum little blowback submachine gun. The idea was we can get an intermediate caliber rifle in 5.56, make it a shorter rifle than you typically get, and uh, we can replace both subguns and rifles. And they did, um, and it seems to have done reasonably well in that role, although you'd have to talk to some French military vets to really get, I think, a notion for how satisfied they were with it as bri in bridging those two roles. Uh, as a bullpup, well, most armies have kind of abandoned the bullpup concept. It was popular for a little while, uh, but like the French, when people replace bullpups, they tend to replace them with standard uh, rifles. There are, the only advantage really that you get with a bullpup is the short overall length and there are a number of trade-offs that you give up in exchange. One important one being you can't really use the rifle ambidextrously uh, without swapping around parts. You also typically have poor triggers in them. That's been addressed in some modern bullpup concepts, but the FAMAS in particular has a, a pretty darn heavy ugh, trigger. Uh, you do also have issues with uh, clearing malfunctions. When it happens, it's always, it's just not quite as 
conducive to quick fixes, uh, actually both with malfunctions and reloads. So there are people out there who practice enough and can do everything super fast on one of these, but you'll always have a lot more training time involved to get to that point with a bullpup rifle than you do with one where the magazine and the action are out here in front of the gun easily in your field of view. And lastly, of course, I called this Le Clarion in the beginning, which is French for the bugle. That name, of course, comes from this big old carry handle up on top, which does kind of make it look like a bugle. Oh. So having chewed your ear off on the background of this thing, why don't we go ahead and take this apart? Because it's pretty cool inside. And this, like I said, this lever delayed blowback system is pretty unusual. Wow, I can actually even get it all in the camera shot here because it is this short little bullpup. Let's start by taking a look at a couple of the markings. So on the right side of the magazine well, uh, we have MOS 223. This is technically the designation of this semi-auto civilian version of the rifle. It is the MOS 223. Uh, MOS stands for Manufacture de Armes de Saint-Étienne. And, and uh, serial number on this is 209B. It appears all of these guns have a B suffix serial number. I'm not entirely sure what that indicates. And then on the left side, we have the rest of the markings. Manufacture National de Armes de Saint-Étienne, so National Arms Factory of Saint-Étienne, not that difficult to translate that. Made in France and then imported by Century Arms of St. Albans, Vermont. Now the magazine release for this guy is located right here on the front of the magazine well, and the idea with these, as with many military guns, is that you are retaining mags. So you're going to grab the mag, push the button, pull the magazine out. You can see this is a definitely a distinct magazine from uh, the the NATO Stanag ones. The bottom of this uh, reinforcing plate is your magazine catch. And then this little block on the back is the over, insur over insertion stop that hits on the back of the receiver here. So it's a, a straight push in magazine. Something I find kind of ironic and uh, humorous is a lot of people got really excited about the Israeli Tavor having this super fast magazine change option where you could just push back with the the back of your thumb, which of course you can do just as well on this FAMAS from 1978. Now, the FAMAS is actually a remarkably ambidextrous rifle, and part of that is the charging handle located up here, right on the top of the action. It does have a little lock hook and it is a reciprocating charging handle. You just grab that, cycle it back, open and close the action. It is kind of nice that this is open to the side, so you can remediate problems a little bit better than you could with some other bullpup actions um, because you do have access in there. Then we also have the folding bipod legs. To use these, you pull out slightly and then rotate down. They do only have this one length available. These two rivets don't adjust anything. Uh, so you get the bipod height or no bipod. The sight here is kind of an interesting and creative idea. You have two flip down apertures. So we've got a large aperture for close range shooting and a small aperture for more precise shooting. And you pick whichever one of them you want to use and flip it up like so. The range adjustment is down here. You have a basic 300 yard zero or 300 meter zero, which you can then rotate to 500 or get it down a bit. Okay, easier to do with the tip of a bullet, but you can see that it raises and lowers the sight right here. Now the front sight is just a little round post. It is windage ad uh, adjustable, but you have to take the carry handle off to adjust it. So it's the sort of thing you zero once and then leave alone. Now there's also this thing on the front sight, which slides up and gives you a little front round hollow aperture sight, which is kind of unusual. Let's take a look at how that works with the rear sight. On the rear sight, if you open up both of these peeps, you get this gigantic, like seven, eight millimeter, probably three eighths of an inch, uh, open tube. And that's actually intended to be your night sight. So you can line up this small front uh, aperture with this big, huge rear aperture. You get a lot of light transmission through it, and it allows you to use the iron sights at night as well as possible. Then when you're not using them, this just folds down behind the front sight and out of the way. So the safety selector is located here in the front of the trigger guard. This position, of course, is safe, which makes it pretty obvious that the rifle is not ready to shoot. 
And then originally you had a semi-auto on one side and a full auto on the other side. On this civilian semi-auto version of the rifle, both forward positions are semi-automatic. There is one other cool little, just like Swiss Army sort of gadget feature here. This is designed to be big enough to use with a glove, but maybe not with a really big glove, or maybe not with a mitten, or maybe not if you're wearing some sort of giant NBC Warfare biochem suit. So if you need to have more space for the trigger, you can actually pull this off of its little peg, rotate the trigger guard around in front. It's got a little slot that it sits in, and now you can run the trigger with like an entire whole hand mitten, should you need to. Lastly, let's take a look at the bayonet. Unlike most bayonets, there is no lug on the back to snap on. Instead, what you do with this is you actually lock it in place on the flash hider between this tab in the front and this tab in the back. The rear tab uh, is spring-loaded to move out of the way, and this actually mounts up on top of the barrel. So I'm going to slide the rear ring on, and then at this point I depress that line. This front lug does line up with a notch in the flash hider, and then it locks on with that lug in the back. So, oh, a little bit rattly, but that's kind of typical of most bayonet lugs. All right, let's look at taking this thing apart. It's actually very simple. It's mostly, well, it's all push pins. We have one pin that holds on the front, uh, the carry handle assembly. So I'm going to push that pin out. It just comes free. It's not a captive pin, which might have been a better idea. Then I can pull this forward, up, and off the rifle. It's kind of a little clumsy here because I've got the sling tightened all the way down on it. Next up, we'll pull the magazine. And the next thing to come off will be the, uh, the rear buttstock assembly. Same thing, we have another pin here. Just push it through from this side. These are very much like HK pins. They have a little wire spring at one end so they don't just fall out. There's that pin. And then this, this one's a little stiffer. There we go. This is just a plastic housing. Actually, kind of, honestly, kind of thin and flimsy feeling here. We'll set that aside. Now we have the trigger assembly and the bolt to remove, and we have two more push pins to do that with. So you can use the tip of a projectile, a bullet. Uh, you can see they've put a little dimple in the middle for that, or you can actually use one of the other cross pins. So I'm going to push that in. This pin, these two pins are captive, so I'm just going to pull it out to that point. And then there is my fire control group. This one's really simple. Uh, the military ones have this somewhat more complicated uh, ratcheting gear system to give them a three round burst. This doesn't have to bother with any of that nonsense. And then lastly, we have the bolt. This one is a little bit uh, stiffer to use because it does have a recoil spring working against it. The recoil spring is in this tube which is not a gas piston. Uh, this is just a hollow tube with a recoil spring and to give you a charging handle. So what I want to do is punch out this cross pin, which is what locks the recoil spring onto the bolt. Now that's all the way out. Now the bolt just slides off the back of the receiver. Once we're down to this level, you can see some other interesting elements in there. For example, the rear sight elevation adjustment. You can see how that works here. It's just a, an eccentric cam to push the sight to different heights. So you'll notice the barrel profile changes substantially at this uh, locating block. That's because this is actually not the barrel. This is just a tube over the barrel. The barrel is free floated in here, which is a, uh, a cool feature. You can see that it's not touching this block right there. This lug is just to give something solid for the charging handle to affix itself to. There is no actual locking shoulder in this rifle because it's a delayed blowback gun. And I'm sure someone's going to see that yellow gunk in the barrel and ask what the heck that is. I believe that's actually a preservative uh, grease in there. I suspect this rifle has probably never been fired. also point out you have a convenient little oil bottle in the pistol grip. Never been used, still feels 
totally empty. All right, now we have the bolt assembly. This thing is super easy to take apart. Oop, there's the bolt body. There's the accelerator. There's the firing pin. And there's the bolt head itself. All right, I've got the bolt together here so we can take a look at how this actually functions. You can see that these two little rabbit ear arms pivot and affect the interaction between the bolt and the bolt carrier traveling. Now, when this is locked up in the rifle, well, not locked, but when it's uh, fully chambered, ready to fire in, in battery, the bolt is all the way back in this configuration. And these two little arms are sitting against surfaces in the receiver. Specifically, right there and right there. So when you fire this, the bolt wants to start moving backwards because, of course, there's a lot of pressure on it. However, it's locked against these two surfaces. So in order for it to move, these two cams have to push up. Now when that happens, it looks like the bolt's going forward here, but when the bolt's fixed in place, what would happen is pressure on these two cams forces the bolt carrier to actually slide backward first. They're, well, these are called accelerators, and what they're doing is they're magnifying the amount of force because there's a little short lever arm here and a longer lever arm up at the top. So the bolt is going to start moving very slowly and the bolt carrier is going to move much more quickly. What this does is delay the opening of this bolt so it doesn't open up um, enough to expose the case of the cartridge until pressure has actually dropped because the bullets left the barrel and a lot of the gas has gone along with it. So this is a very simple system. It's clever. It's been used in a few other uh, carbines, but not very many. Um, the, uh, what is it, the Dominican Republic made a carbine using this system um, as pioneered by a Hungarian designer. How's that for a weird combination? But what you've got here is the bolt can't really open until after this bolt carrier has been cammed backwards. That takes time because of the, the in inertia of this extra mass of the bolt carrier. And once, now once it's in this position, now these two arms are no longer touching the receiver and the whole thing can freely move backwards. And it does. Something else I want to point out in here, you'll notice that there are two extractors, except that this one on the right is fake. It's just a placeholder. It doesn't actually have an extractor uh, hook in it or a spring. This is what determines which side of the rifle uh, ejection happens on. So in this case, Ejectors on this side, so cases are going to flip out that direction. The, see, the, the ejector plunger is right in the bottom, centrally located. Now, you can take, using this pin, you can actually remove these two and replace them so that the dummies on this side, just a placeholder, and the actual extractors on that side, that would cause cases to eject out that side of the action. And when we look at the the rear stock, you can see they've actually cut ejection ports in both sides. I can take this cheek piece, pop it off, and hey oh, it's open on both sides. I can take this cheek piece and snap it back onto the right side of the gun. Now I've made a lefty friendly version. I can swap the extractor so it ejects out this side, swap the cheek piece, and in fact we even have sling swivels on both sides so I can take this fancy, super fancy three-point sling, and I can swap it around to the other side of the buttstock. I can swap the bipod legs, because the front sling swivel is attached to the left bipod leg. I can swap that over. Every single feature of this, I, if it's not ambidextrous to begin with, it is uh, convertible from left to right without any additional parts. And that, that really is kind of cool. One other little feature in here that I want to point out, or rather lack of feature, there's a little rubber buffer pad on the back, and you can see that white surface. Uh, that is a space for a feature that's on the military version of the FAMAS that was left off of the civilian one. On the military guns, there's actually a little hook and uh, spring buffer in there that reduces, well, buffers uh, the impact of the bolt on the back of the receiver with each shot. Uh, I guess they figured for semi-auto without the full auto capability, you didn't really need that. As a result, the semi-auto civilian FAMAS rifles do have a bit harsher recoil. Um, not really harsh, but kind of abrupt, because you are getting more impact of the bolt carrier onto the rear of the, uh, the stock, which is then going to translate into more, a more abrupt impact onto your shoulder. So, Now the top of this carry handle is just a trough. This sits in between the sights. 
yeah this is plastic but uh, doesn't really do anything. I would also, actually it's, it's interesting to point out, this lug is what locks uh, the carry handle in place. So it sits, this lug sits on top of a plug on the front of the charging handle assembly, right there. This is attached to the stock and to the action back here, but it's not actually attached to the barrel in any way, because the barrel is free floated inside this block. What that means is that the bipod, the bipod being here on the front handle assembly, is actually free floated away from the barrel. So you can put pressure on the bipod or put pressure on the sling, and it's not going to affect your zero. That's, that's a clever, interesting element to the rifle design. One last thing to show you here is the trigger mechanism. So when I pull the trigger, it's just got this long connecting bar that's going to pull this forward. There's our, our trigger spring. So we've got this hook right there. So that hook connects to this triangular piece and pulls it forward. If you look at the hammer here, you can see the sear notch right there, which is held in place by this under part with the number two on it. When I pull this forward, I'm going to hold this back so it doesn't snap on me. When I pull that forward, it clears and allows the hammer to drop. Pretty simple. Just doing this manually, you can really feel for how much spring pressure and travel there is on it. This is not a very good trigger, unfortunately. The semi-auto version of the FAMAS, which we have here, is really quite the rare bird. Uh, if you look around on the internet, you'll see people suggest that only 100 to 125 of these were imported into the U.S. Uh, having looked at a bunch of serial numbers, I think that's actually, I think the numbers are actually about double that. Uh, I know of serial numbers as low as 30-something, and this is serial number 209, which kind of suggests they're, assuming they did a continuous, assuming they did a continuous uh, serial number block, that would suggest that there are at least 209 of them, uh, maybe 225 or 250. A little more than most people think, but that still makes it a very unusual rifle in this country. Now, when Century brought these in, uh, they, Century didn't have any hand in building them. They simply bought them from uh, the San Antian factory and imported them over here. Uh, interestingly, at the time, you could also buy a semi-auto FAMAS in France, although over there they were chambered for the 222 Remington cartridge because uh, France had a restriction, or still does, I believe, on civilian ownership of military calibers. So 223 was not allowed, but 222 Remington was okay. Anyway, the, the 223 versions that came into the U.S., uh, obviously, they are semi-auto only. They leave off a few of the military uh, bits. The, uh, there are ribs on the barrel here for rifle grenades on the military one. The rifle grenade sight has been left off. The recoil buffer, like I mentioned, has been left off, and obviously semi-auto only. Now, when Century brought these in, they were really expensive. Uh, in 1988, they were selling one of these rifles for $995. To put that in a little bit of context, they were also selling Steyr Augs at the same time. Another hot, new, you know, cutting-edge bullpup rifle. That came with, I think, five mags and a scope, and you could get one of those for 650 bucks. So, substantially less than this rifle. Uh, and $1,000 in 1988 was quite a substantial amount of money compared to today. So, these took several years to sell. Uh, once they did sell out, there were never any other batches brought in because these came in in 1988, like I said, which was just before the 1989 U.S. ban on imported assault weapons. So that, that ban didn't have any impact on things that were made in the U.S., but it did end the importation of semi-auto foreign rifles like this one. So, so um, it's really cool to get a chance to take a look at this one. As I mentioned in the disassembly, I believe this thing is probably unfired still out of the box uh, from whoever originally bought it. So it is in gorgeous condition. If you're interested in adding it to your own collection, uh, if you want to play with one of the original combat bullpups, well, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on the rifle. And check out their pictures, their description, and uh, place a bid online or come up here to participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.